preached to you are commanded to live what is preached and taught through Scripture. And we all are slaves to Christ. So put your pride away and realize that it's not about you. When I do have arguments very rarely with my wife, they happen because of my pride. That's why, that, that's why they happen. Kathy will say something I don't like or do something I don't like, and instead of just letting it go with grace, I've had enough. And that had enough always works out bad for me. <laughs> you know, there are over 50 one another's in the New Testament. And I want to share 15 of them with you this morning. Just 15 of the over 50 of them are. Well, we are called to pray for one another. Um, on Sunday mornings, I, I can tell you that that room right there and that room right there has never outgrown, and I wish it would. I wish there were so many men and so many women that came at 7 o'clock in the morning to pray that we would have to come in here and do it. Why do we do it? Why do we come and why, why, why are the elders here on Sunday mornings to pray with me? Why are the deacons of the day here to come and pray with me and pray with Because we pray for the service. Who are we praying for? You. We're praying for the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. We're praying that that God would be glorified in this place. So, so what we do, the first thing we do on Sunday mornings is come in here and, and pray over this place. Not the building, the people. That everything that happens in this place would happen for the glory of God. Not about us. We don't come in here and pray for people on the, on the sick list. We don't come do that on Sunday mornings in here. We don't pray for other things. I mean, sometimes it'll go off. But the main focus is on this day, what we're doing for him. But we're also commanded to pray for one another. We have a, we have a prayer list, um, a prayer wall on our website. And I don't want to embarrass anybody by saying, raise your hands if you go there daily. But do you go there daily? Do you go and look to see if there's what you could be praying for? Of who you can be praying for in the church? We, we do these things because we're commanded to pray for one another. You see, it's not about you. It's not about me it's all about God and it's about our brothers and sisters in Christ you know why we have a body you know why we have a body of believers to pray for one another because we're in spiritual warfare all the time and sometimes admit it Christian you're in a place you can't even pray for yourself something's going on in your life and you, and you can't even pray for yourself we're called to pray for one another do you have a relationship good enough that you can call somebody up and say you know what life really stinks for me right now I don't feel like opening my Bible I don't feel like living for Christ right now would you pray for me I get those and I'm so thankful that I have relationships with men and women in this church that can do that do you have relationships with people like that in the church that you could that you can pray for them when they're like that and not call somebody else and tell them guess who called me or put it on through a text stream that, that, that look what happened to this person? Or, or are you concerned enough that you pray for people? Do you call people that you pray for and tell them you're praying for them? Hey, I heard you were having a really difficult time. If there's anything I can do for you, and let me start with praying for you right now. One thing I do when I'm on the phone with you is I pray with you. I always pray with you. If you, give, if you bring a concern to me, I pray with you. I felt like a dog last night because I took a call from a member of the church. It was later in the evening. I talked to him. I was exhausted. was tired. I didn't pray with him. Kathy looked over at me, and she goes, you think you ought to have prayed with him before you got off the phone? <laughs> oh, Lordy. See, I, I fail. We all fail. But what's our desire? Pray for one another. And then we're told to greet one another. Now, I could point some fingers, but I won't. Some of you never get out of your seat on Sunday mornings. You sit right where you're at. You act like you're glued to it. Pastor gets up here, and Pastor Kyle says, Hey, welcome to Grace Harvest Baptist Church. If you're a visitor here, we got this little thing for you to fill out. 
And you home folks, please read your bulletins. I know you're not even listening to me when I say it, but please read your bulletins. That's what he's thinking. Because <laughs> he'll get a call tomorrow and go, what, what? and he'll go, did you read your bulletin? And then he says what he says, take the time to greet one another. And I'll walk around, and, uh, but some of you just sit right where you're at, and you won't even, in the church, won't even walk around and say hi to somebody. Now, Christian, I'm not talking that's all there is to greeting. That's not what, that's not what the Scripture's talking about here, but that's a little simple thing. It's not about you. It's not about the pastor coming over to you to shake your hand or anything else. It's about you showing the love of Christ for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember when I told you a couple weeks ago what Kathy said? She felt like she was in a desert because she wasn't in the building. She felt like she was in the desert because the only dogs, only the dogs were there and they're slobbing all over and she sure didn't want them at our house. <laughs> Greet one another. Be, be, be there for one another. How many times have you been in a place where a brother or sister has called you, sent you a text? Not, 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 with, not with two other people. But by, he sent one text to you and said, I just want to let you know, God placed you on my heart today and I'm praying for you. I'm here for you. I have seen the love of Christ I, I, uh, displayed uh, abundantly with my wife um, going through her surgery this time. More so than any other time. I don't know what it is, but it's just been people have just loved on her and loved on us. And it has just been such a blessing and encouragement to me. You've prayed for me. You've greeted with us. We, we got a, um, I just, I told that person just a little while ago, um, this woman sent Kathy a card. It was the coolest card. It's still in the house. Most cards we throw away, right, after a couple of days. This card, you open it up, you fold it up, and it was a bouquet of flowers. It was the coolest thing. I couldn't tell you what it said, but I thought the flowers looked cool. <laughs> but that made, me, that made me smile this morning when I saw it. What was that? It was a sister in Christ who sent a sister in Christ an encouraging note. Pray for one another. Greet one another. Be kindly affectionate to one another. Be kindly affectionate. Is it hard to be affectionate to other people? It shouldn't be as a Christian. It should never be hard to be affectionate towards another believer in Christ. Give preference to one another. What does that mean? It means you don't have to be right. You do not have to be right all the time. My wife taught me that valuable lesson years and years ago. We had, I remember we had a big argument, and, and she said, you know what, honey, you're right. I went, what would you just say? Oh, you're right. Don't patronize me. And, and I remember we finally had this really long conversation. She says, honey, I learned a long time ago I don't always have to be right, especially with you. And you might not think about that sometimes. You don't, why do you always think you have to be the one that's right? Why do you always have to be the one to get the last word in? All of us could take counsel on that. Give preference to one another. When you can cover something up with grace, cover it up. Cover it up. Don't bring it up. Cover it up. Live peacefully with each other. That means, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we should not be afraid to walk into a building and walk up to any member of this church and have a conversation with them. Are there people within this body right now that you would not have a conversation with because you hold a grudge against them? You know what my prayer for you is right now? I pray that you repent of that, you reach out to that person, and you make it right. You make it right. Live peacefully with each other. Encourage one another. Encourage one another. Again, how hard is it to send a text? Send a card every once in a while to make a phone call, to invite somebody. I, I, I remember when I, when I talk to young couples sometimes, and I know, I know it's tough. I know what it's like when you're starting out in life and you don't have two nickels rubbed together and you're worried about what you're going to feed and then the preacher says, why don't you have somebody over for dinner? And you know, what I, you know what I tell them? It can be hot dogs. It can be hot dogs and a bag of chips. Have fellowship. Encourage one another. When somebody's going through a hard time, bad time, invite them over. Have them over. Show them hospitality. Love on them. And then we see accept one another. Accept for who they are. Look, we're all weird. 
Right? Right, I know. I know some women here on Sunday mornings look and go, I don't even know how Kathy can go home with him, let alone live, spend a life with him. We are all different. We are all weird. But we need to accept one another. God made us different. He didn't make us all the same. He made us different. Let, let us appreciate those differences. Admonish and warn one another. Oh, Pastor, now you're stepping. I can do all those other things, but nobody better come up and warn me. We do this in love. When I teach and preach, when I preach God's Word on Sunday morning, you'll hear me pray sometimes, Lord, use this for correction in people's lives. It's admonishing. God's Word is the one that corrects. Sometimes you have a relationship with somebody that you can pull aside, put the arm around them, you don't come to the pastor. You don't go to your elder. You don't go to his wife. You go to him. And you sit down with him, and you say, I'm worried about you. This is what I see. I, I, I saw you on fire for the Lord. I saw how you served God. I saw how you loved his people. And I don't see that fire anymore. I don't see it. I'm worried about you. Or... You see a sister in Christ, ladies, and all of a sudden you notice that her spiritual walk is not what it used to be. And then not only is it not what it you find her, this person's calling you up to tell you about other people. Do you stop it? You go, look, I, I understand you're upset, but let, let's not go there with them. Let's pray for them, and let me, you, you and I talk back and forth. You warn them. You warn them that, that that's not the way for believers to act. We're not, we're not to gossip. We are to admonish and warn one another, as the Bible tells us to. Um, do not speak evil of one another. Again, we're talking to the church here. We're talking to the church. Don't speak evil of one another. If you've got a beef with a brother and sister, go to that person. Talk to them. Don't try to get a posse up to get on your side so that when the stuff really hits the fan, you feel like you've got half the church on your side. Don't speak evil of somebody else. And then here's the big one. Serve one another. Serve one another. It doesn't say serve self. It says serve one another. And I'll expand on that more in a moment be patient with one another be patient as brothers and sisters in Christ we will say stupid things we will do stupid things every member of this church I've sat down with you and told you when you join the church that I am not perfect by any stretch of the imagination and I will disappoint you I will hurt you but I always have this caveat with it I will never do it on purpose I will never maliciously hurt you. I, I, I say stupid things sometimes. I do stupid things sometimes. But my heart is not to hurt you and crush you. And when I, if I realize I've done that, it, it, I weep. I weep. I, I, I take that seriously. And, and as your shepherd and as the elders are your shepherds, we're called to be patient, especially with you more so. But it doesn't excuse you not being patient with one another and not losing your temper. And bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. You see, Christ gives us the body of Christ to help us get through this life. You're not called to do it by yourself. There are times when we will have to suffer by ourselves. If you ever put in prison for the cause of Christ, you have to face death for the cause of Christ. But other times, you're just going through valleys in your life, and are your brothers and sisters there to help you? Are you there to help them? You know, I was thrilled yesterday, bear one of the burn, um, uh, the, the move, um, the move to Hamilton's uh, was yesterday, and it was a long move. It wasn't a short move, and uh, I, I told the elders a long time ago, uh, it was easy to move people in your 50s. When you get to be 66, it ain't so easy, especially when uh, some of the men told me that uh, Rich had a freezer that was Bigger freezer he's ever seen and full of, full of stuff, and it was heavy. I'm like, I'm glad I missed that out on that one. Four of them? Four of them. And I missed, I, missed, I missed out on that one. But I was so, my heart soared 
when I heard how many men were there. My heart soared that the men of this church gathered and helped that family, a brother and sister in Christ, move. And that's what we are called to do. We are a family. There's not one person here, if your son or daughter called and said, I need help, you wouldn't go. Would you say no to a brother and sister in Christ? Would you? We're all children of the living God, and we will spend eternity together. Should there anything be withheld from our brothers and sisters in Christ, especially when they're going through burdens? Nobody likes to go through burdens alone. Nobody. You get that sit down in the doctor's office, and the doctor looks across the table from you and just says, you have cancer. Nobody wants to hear those words. And I don't know how the world does it without Christ first and the body of believers to be with them. Bear one another's burdens. Be kind to one another. Be kind, Christian, to one another. Don't repay evil for evil. Be at peace with all men as it depends on you. And here's another one. It's hard to wrap yourself with a flag with and then do this. Submit to one another. It's hard to be that lone ranger uh, and be a Christian. Because we're told to submit to one another. Oh, Lord, I don't like that word. Submit? You mean really the Bible says to submit to the elders that God's placed over you to watch care over your souls? We're, we're not here to lord over you. Not one, not one of us is here to lord over you and tell you what you can do, what movie you can watch, what car you can drive, what house you can buy, what clothes you can wear. You'll never hear an elder tell you that. But I tell you what you will hear an elder tell you is how to live for God. And he will tell you that this is what God says, how you deal with an issue in your life. And, and he will do the one another's with you. And then you know what happens when it comes against the, the human flesh? When I or another one of the elders has to tell somebody and correct something, it's the, it's the pride comes right up and says, how dare you think you have any authority over me? You see, it's all sweet. It sounds really good when we read in Scripture. But the minute we, something happens that we don't like, we take our ball and go home. Submit to one another and be hospitable to one another. Be hospitable. Open your homes. Open your lives up to each other. First Peter 4, 10 through 11. As each one has received a gift, employ it in the serving of one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks... Uh, whoever serves as one serving by the strength which God supplies so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belongs the glory and might forever and ever. Amen. See, we can put all the one another's under the umbrella of serving one another. But we need to use the gifts of God gave us to serve the body as Peter reminds us. We're given our gifts to serve the body. We weren't given our gifts to serve ourselves. And here at GHPC, we make that available to every member of the church. You have an opportunity and an expectation that you will serve. And as a matter of fact, it really isn't an option for a member of GHPC not to be serving. You're called to serve. We have plenty of places for you to serve here at Grace Harvest. Years ago, when uh, there were 60 of us moving into the building, and uh, I used to ask when people would join a church, can you sing, can you cut grass? <laughs> that was a two thing. And can you play the fiddle? I'm still looking for a fiddle player. Can you sing, can you play a uh, fiddle, or can you cut grass? That was what, that's what we did. I mean, that, that's, that was it. But then we grew. And as we grew, we have a bunch of places to serve. We have a women's ministry here that's headed up by Amy Patrick. Amy is not here today, or I get her to raise her hand. Um, and uh, we have a women's ministry here. 
that serves the body of Christ. They're here to serve each other. They're here to serve the body. They, they meet, the um, Women of Grace, they, they meet on Saturday mornings and uh, twice a month. And uh, they get together and, and have a Bible study together. Uh, Gina had just led and finished uh, a Bible study in the book of James. It's available online. Uh, there's plenty of places that you can serve within the women's ministry. Contact Amy Patrick. Uh, Brandon Tibbetts, raise your hand back there. We're back in the back corner. Brandon Tibbetts, uh, he's the lead of our men's ministry. We have many men helping him in that area. Um, men, it's a place that, that if you're not serving and you're designed to serve within the men's ministry, Brandon. Youth ministry, Pastor Brian, raise his hand there. Um, and uh, he is, if you, he was always looking for people to help and to serve. Um, our youth are getting ready to go away uh, tomorrow, and after the 11 o'clock service, we're going to have, uh, we'll lay hands on them and pray for them, that God will bring our young people to saving faith that don't know him, and strengthen the faith of the ones that do know him. Um, we have children's ministry. Aaron, you here, or are you with the kids right now? With the kids. <laughs> um, we have, we have, you can see Aaron, we're children's ministry. We're always needing help there. You know, it, it's an amazing thing. We love kids. We don't like being with them. <laughs> I said it, didn't I? I didn't like it. I, I remember we were at Swift Creek, and uh, I felt guilty one time when the preacher preached on serving, and I wasn't doing anything. And, you know, there's a bunch of people there. They can all do it, not me. I, I work overtime. <laughs> and, I've, and I felt guilty. So I went to serve. And I wish I could tell you it was a bunch of times, but it wasn't. We, in one of the trailers, Kathy and I, I said, I'll serve with you, babe. I'm going to go in there. I'm, I'm going to serve with you one Sunday. And so we went in there, and they had these babies in these cribs. And they had like I don't know, 10, 12 cribs around the room. And, and it was me and her and uh, uh, maybe another lady in there. I couldn't wait to get out of there. <laughs> it was driving me crazy. And guess what? I never served in there again. Shame on me. Because, you know, it would be one thing if I said I went and served somewhere else. It wasn't until years later that I started teaching and started serving. It's, it's amazing how we have such opportunities to serve. And, folks, um, I, I hope that you understand as a member of Grace Harvest Baptist Church, a member of your church, you're not called to sit on the bench. You're not. You're called to serve. We have a frontline ministry. You, you all have seen Kim stand out there and many other ladies and men who, 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 who Kim, raise your hand. She's right up there. Uh, when it's nice weather, we, they go outside and they stand out there. And when it's not so nice weather, we stand in here and we greet our visitors and we give them a little package and we let them know. That's, that's a ministry opportunity to serve. Um, we have the fellowship ministry, Michelle fellowship ministry here she's always can use help in 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 that area michelle tell tell us what you do in a fellowship ministry what what, what goes on there so when we have our events when we have our events they just don't happen the fellowship ministry makes sure it happens and helps and so always looking for help there Communication ministry, Pastor Cal, that's why I said he is up here and he tells you week after week. Home folks, open up your bulletin. Read your bulletin. Read the email that Aaron sent, I mean that um, Rachel sends out every Friday. It tells you what's going on. So you don't call up and say or walk up to Pastor Cal and say, hey, when is that happening? And you want to make him sin when you ask him that. But he refrains. He refrains. Uh, maintenance ministry, Tim Bailey, raise your hand over there. Um, take, we, we have to take care of this building on the inside and the outside. And we, are, we have teams of, of folks that do that, and we're much appreciative. But that's a, another place that you can serve in. Uh, prayer ministry, Ian, where do you go? You know, I talked about you, Jesse, the first service because you got up and left me. Uh, 
So Ian Hicks, my son-in-law, he's in charge of the prayer ministry. We are, he's working with uh, Jesse Royal about that. We're trying to expand our prayer ministry. For some reason, that's one of the, the, the places that churches struggle, and our church is no exception, with the prayer ministry. People don't mind having prayer time themselves, but it's something about praying with other people that becomes an issue. But uh, Ian Hicks is in charge of that. Um, and we see uh, homeschool, homeschool Hub Ministry, Amy Patrick. Our homeschool hub has been such a blessing to this church and to me personally as a, as a shepherd of the, and as a grandfather. To know that my grandchildren can come and they can sit in a classroom and they can have Pastor Brian teach them theology. And they, can have, and they have members of this church teach them things about science. I tell you what, it, it, if anybody has not been over there and seen some of the artistic work that Aislinn Tibbet, Tibbetts is in charge of, you're missing out. That, she is extremely talented, and she shares that talent with our children. We, we have top-notch moms here that help teach. And some of you, if you're... If you're a teacher and you have some of that ability, and you, you know, see Pastor Cal, talk to him. Maybe there's a place you can. So I'm not saying there 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 could be a place for everyone to teach there, but you know we're we always want to s- expand our ministry opportunities and our places for people to serve. In our worship ministry, I guess you can't guess who leads that. Uh, <laughs> Pastor Cal, he's our worship leader, and Gina, his faithful wife, and and and. Uh, who plays the piano and faithfully has played the keyboard for us for years, who she has the, the musical talent and ability and knowledge uh, to help with our worship team. And then every faithful member that comes, we, they come Tuesday nights. Remember, I always love telling this story. I always thought worship team showed up on Sunday morning and started singing. Pascal always gets a smile out of him. Gina's like, you idiot. And it's like, it's like I, because I always thought, you know, they just show up. I mean, they they, they they're gifted. They play this stuff. And then they started practicing in my house. I'm going, oh, okay. And then I come up here and had the pleasure and privilege to, to come up here when I bring Kathy and, uh, and sit in my office and hear, hear them worship, hear a devotion that goes on. They do a worship service on Tuesday night as they come. and they, and they if, you, if you have a voice and you're not serving, why don't you come? See Pastor Cal. Um. If you play an instrument, come and, and, and see. Um, don't, don't waste the talent that God's given you and the gifts that he's given you when not serving. And then we have my favorite one because they keep me alive every week, safety and security. Um, I always feel like I'm the president of the United States when I walk out that door and they put their little fingers right here. <laughs> I, I love the fact we have men and women who serve um, see Alan Chambers are you here? Alan raised his hand and Doug Massini and um, you guys they're, they're here to, to serve you didn't raise your hand I know you don't <laughs> but uh, see Jesse if that's a place you want to serve you know okay I, I, I am going to say something about our security team though it, it's, uh, it's a pleasure and privilege to, to be a shepherd here and, and to know that these men have a desire. Um, but none of these places, none of these ministries is a place to hide either. Let me, let me say that. It's not a place to hide. If you're serving, that means you're participating in the worship service when you're not serving. It, it, it doesn't mean that you just serve someplace, check a box, and they go home and never show, never show hope. For, that's, not, that's not being part of the body. So in our security team also, safety and security, also it, it, it's our, uh, our nurses that are here. We have our nurses have signed up. And so if, if Pastor Mark drops on the floor, we got nurses that run up and do CPR. And, uh, but more seriously, they, they're here to help with the, the things and situations that arise. We are blessed to have several medical people here in our church uh, to take care of that. And then uh, we have a new ministry. It's the uh, widow's ministry that is in such a, uh, with such a need. And uh, Rachel is in charge of that ministry, and Pastor Cal is the elder overseeing it, and it was a burden upon Cal, Pastor Cal's heart. Uh, we started this ministry, 
and um, it's, it's a place for us to minister to our widows and for them to serve. I, I spoke, had the privilege of speaking with them a couple of weeks ago and telling them that, what a, you know, um, that all because they are in a place they are in, in their lives, God's not done with them. God's not done with them. And so it's, it's an opportunity for all. Christian, if you've still got breath in your body, you're called to serve. Yes. Oh, yeah, outreach. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, I, I skipped. Oh, Victoria, where are you? Raise your hand. <laughs> Our sweet Victoria in the back. Victoria, when she first came here, I, I, I'll never forget this story. Victoria came and uh, sat down with me, and she, she has a heart and passion and a gift and a desire to reach out to those that society would have nothing to do with. And when she came to me and, and she first talked to me and, and she had some questions and, and I, I love this story because Victoria was, came from a church that allowed her to do some things that we would not allow a, a woman to do here. And she graciously submitted to that. She saw the scripture, but it didn't stop her from serving. Matter of fact, it put a fire in her, I think. And, and Victoria had us up at Monroe Park. We, we gave out blankets one year. She had a servant there. We did the respite for years. She's the one, and those who helped her, and Ted with her, who spearheaded that opportunity for us to go into the respite. We got nothing out of that, folks. We weren't going to get any members from off of Belt Boulevard in the city of Richmond. We weren't going to get anybody writing us checks to take on a brick from the wall. But what we did was we responded, as Christ said, to help those less fortunate than us, to be there and minister to them and share the gospel. We, we would hand out Bibles there. We would give glasses there, and we would provide food for them. COVID hit, and uh, Victoria, you still brought meals during that time, right? We would drop them off. They wouldn't let us in, but we dropped them off. And then and they kind of kind of shut the door on us, and then we, Victoria, and they found another way. We, and now we're right down the street from that and uh, a little bit further into town, and we, uh, we, we help the veterans. So we work with the veterans, and we're doing the exact same thing, kind of thing we were doing with them. We go to the veterans. I had, I, I had the privilege to go once and lead a devotion, and uh, our, our brothers and sisters here from Grace Harvest went, and they provide a meal for them, serve them their meal, and then the gospel shared, and Bibles are given out. That, again, we're not going to get anything out of it. We have the nursing home. We have the nursing home ministry and, and, uh, th that we go to once a month. These are, our, these are our outreach ministries that when we say outreach, we're talking about reaching those less fortunate than us and the, the ones that are forgotten by society that we're, we should never do. We should never do. And uh, so if you have any questions about that and you would love to serve, we would always love for people to go uh, and help down at the Veterans Center at, or at the nursing home. Um, Please see Victoria again, or Pastor, uh, or Brian Hayes, well, Elder. I did front line. I did do front line. Oh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, th I would be in trouble again, wouldn't I? Uh, so, so, and then also here, what ministry does that fall under? The shoebox, Christmas, shoe, the shoebox, outreach. outreach. Okay. Uh, you, if if you've been here for any length of time. You know, we have a sweet little elf that shows up at Christmas. <laughs> and uh, about, th about two months before Christmas, about September this year, you'll do the same thing. And what it is, is we have the shoebox ministry here. And, and it's not about shoes. It's about boxes that we fill up with small items that the gospel is presented to children around the world. And um, Linda and Kermit had the privilege and, and honor to go down, uh, down to where these folks put the boxes together. And uh, they've been very influential in our church taking this on. Here's a perfect example. Somebody comes to the elders and says, hey, this is what I'd like us to do. We say, run with it. And they did. And uh, how many boxes did we collect last year? 143. 143. I'd love for us to outdo that this year, folks. Be thinking about things like that. And again, that's another outreach. We're not getting anything out of it. The baby bottles. And if I forget anybody else, please just shout out if anything I forgot. Because, and the baby bottles are in the back that you can pick them up. We fill these up with, with coins uh, or dollar bills or $10 bills or $20 bills or whatever bills you want to. And, and um, we give this to uh, 
the women of the centers who take care of women who are in a position that they need help. And if they can't get help from Christians, who are they going to get it from? Who are they going to get it from? So there's plenty. I mean, as you see, there's a whole lot more than just cutting grass and singing in the worship team anymore. There's a whole lot more for us to do. All right. And then um, that brings us to giving. Oh, boy, he's got to talk about this, doesn't he? Um. Christians today often think that what they give to the local church is a tithe, when in reality it's an offering. What we do here at Grace Harvest is we take up an offering. And Christians' tithing is a misnomer because Christians are under no obligation to fulfill the command of tithe as given to the Israelites as part of the Mosaic Law. It was Mosaic Law, not given to the church. The tithe was a requirement of the law in which the Israelites were to give 10% of everything they earned and grew to the tabernacle or temple. The New Testament nowhere, nowhere commands or even recommends that Christians submit to a legalistic tithing system. Paul states that believers should set aside a portion of their income as an offering, but this is not a tithe. God expected the Israelites to honor him by giving the first fruits of what he gave to them. In Leviticus, Leviticus 27.30, Thus all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, belongs to Yahweh. It is holy to Yahweh. Giving 10% of the tithe was commanded of the Israelites and was therefore an obligation. When Christ died on the cross, he fulfilled the requirements of the law and made the mandatory 10% tithe obsolete. To continue to insist that this is still in effect is to nullify, at least in part, the sacrifice of Christ um, and return to the ideal of justification by works and law keeping. You're going to hear the sermon on that today, if you weren't here first service, about how we try to do things to get saved. We're not commanded to do this. Um, the first fruits offering found is in fulfillment in Jesus. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. An offering is that which is freely given by me, by you, by Christians to the work of the Lord, the local church, and, our, and ministries or missions. But offerings are far more than simply writing a check on Sunday. We are to offer much more to God than our monetary resources. Romans 12.1 exhorts us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God as part of our worship. In Romans 6.13, and do not go on presenting your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. God is not nearly in, as interested in our monetary offering as he is our submission and obedience. Remember that, Christian. The truth is that he doesn't need our resources to accomplish his plans or purposes. After all, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the Psalms 50.10 tells us, and needs nothing from us. It's amazing when you think about what God has done here at Grace Harvest. When you take a, a small group of believers... Um, 30 some people who come out to Amelia and purchase this land for $180,000. 30 people. 2008. 2010, it would have been a third of that. 2008, it was top dollar. When Jesse spoke for the elders and spoke to the owners of the property, and said that God has moved us to purchase this land, but we want to tell you we're not going to borrow for the land. And that we trust God who will provide for us, but if you need to sell it, you go ahead and sell it. Um, and the owners were gracious enough to say to us, no, we feel like this is meant to be, so you pay us when you can pay us. That's a lot of confidence in a group of 30 people to give them $180,000, right? In one year, this land was paid off. One year. How could that be done? 
Well, it was done because it was God who wanted it done. And it got done. Then, 2009, that was 2008 we bought the land. 2009, we started building this building. Right in the middle of a recession. People were losing homes, jobs, and we built this building. Fast forward, two years ago, we dedicated that building. We built that in the middle of a pandemic. You, you see that over there, Pascal? What did we build that building for, or what did we start the loan with here? Do you remember? 600000 We built it. That's what we financed. We paid. It was seven eighty. Seven eighty for this building. You see what that thing over there says? We're down to two eighty five. Praise the Lord, Pastor Cal. Two seventy five from seven eighty in two years this building. How does that happen? Do, do you see me get up every week and preach on tithing and you got to give let's pass the plate around one more time we didn't get enough come on <laughs> we're the only reason i'm teaching it now is part of our dna class you see when i sit down with you and i share this with you as a new member i tell you this is what we teach this is what we preach here god has blessed us at this church i've watched god bless us and i've watched you respond and I've seen God do his work here. And you know why I think that happens? Because I can't speak for God. But I firmly believe it's because we've always said that we will stand on the word of God. We will proclaim Christ and him crucified. We do the one another's. Not perfectly, but we do them. And we do it to the least of these. As I shared with you, the ministry of the outreach through Victoria and her desire to see those people come to saving faith in Christ. It's because we are obedient to the little things that God has honored us with the blessings he's honored with us. You'll never hear me stand up here and say, hey guys, give $10 and God will give you 100 Because he ain't going to do it. Could he do it? Sure he could. Sure he could. But I tell you what, when you fully understand and grasp the concept of giving of your first fruits unto the Lord, that everything that God has given to you, he, everything, everything, Kathy and Mark Wells own is God's. Everything. My house, my cars, my clothes, everything I own belongs to God. How can I withhold anything from him? The one has blessed me with so much. So much. And you know what? Another thing that tithing does, it handcuffs people. You imagine if you grow up into a legalistic system where the pastor gets up week after week and tells you to tithe, 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 and something happens in your family, no fault of your own, and you lose your job or lose something, or you don't, or an emergency comes up and you have to take care of something, but you have to write that tithe check because you feel guilty if you don't give. Christian, God wants you to be a cheerful giver. Give of your first fruits. And you give sacrificially. I share this story every time I teach this class. When Kathy and I, we, I, was, I was the guy who would not let my wife give. I, I wasn't going to do it. I, I, was just a, I was a police officer making not a whole lot of money. We had one car, seven of us living in a 1,400 square foot house. Um, didn't have, we didn't have nothing. And she wants to write a check to the church big old church over there in Swift Creek. They're all rich people over there. They don't, they don't need my money. Oh, and I was as stubborn as the rest of them. And I can remember thinking, and I remember preaching up here and preached one Sunday, and they, they taught tithing there. And they said, just try it. Just try it. Just, just see what God will do. And God used that sermon to change my life. I went home and told Kathy, I said, look, I know this ain't going to work. <laughs> it is not going to work. Not going to work. And so, but we'll try it. So, Kathy's thinking, okay, God, you've got to you appreciate you changing his heart a little bit. So we started. Well, you know, God didn't give me any more money. I didn't get a pay raise. I didn't get a promotion. I still worked 20 to 30 hours overtime every week. I did that for 27 years of my career. 
But what he did was he changed my heart. So back in the day, my kids would still, still tell you that we used to go to movie time video or video world all the time. You'd, Pam, I see you smiling. It was up there in a the corner on 360. I would buy videos like they were candy. I drank back then. I'd have beer in the house. I'd have a liquor bottle of liquor in the house. I wasn't a drunk. Didn't get drunk. But I had that kind of, and I would buy stuff on work. I'd just buy stuff. Working overtime, I would buy stupid stuff. And so what happened was God changed my heart, and I stopped buying stuff that didn't need to have. And guess what happened? Kathy wrote that check at the end of the month, and we had extra money. It wasn't because God gave me any more. He changed my heart and my desires. Christian, the reason some of you may not give is because you've got the wrong desires. Your desire is to see God glorified. You want the next biggest thing. And God says, I got something much bigger for you. Now, you give as the Lord desires for you to give. You cheerful heart. Don't, don't take out your checkbook on Sunday morning, look at the spouse and go, Burr. 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 <laughs> Cheerful. Cheerful heart. Remember that God will use you as a blessing to others. See, a heart who gives generously, willingly, and cheerfully in response to the love and grace that abound in Christ. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows with blessings will also reap with blessings. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, not because the preacher says you got to give, not because somebody tells you you got to give, but for God loves a cheerful giver. A, and God is able to make every grace abound to you so that in everything and every time, having every sufficiency, you may have an abundance for every good deed. And so I'm going to run through these now because I'm, a, I'm backed up to the clock. But five questions to answer why we give. Why we give. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the church of Galatia to Galatia, so do you also. So the primary purpose of, the, of giving, as taught in the New Testament, is for support of the saints in the church. That's what it's for. As Christians, our first obligation is to support fellow believers, individually and collectively. The church's first financial responsibility is to invest in its own life and its own people. We are to give to support those among us who are poor and needy. In other words, we give for the people, for the congregation needs, and whatever, whatever those needs are. There are people in our church who are from time to time have their needs met as we give. And as we give money to them, we also supply for what they don't have. Just as Paul's offering was not only an act of welfare in mind, but it was an act of binding together a unity and in love, so we are to give money that can be used, not just to meet physical, but to meet spiritual one's needs as well. When you give an offering at Grace Harvest, some of it will go to meet the needs of people who don't have what they need and the, for the basic necessities of life. We give so, to support the church, not only its people, but its pastors as well. Paul received collections for himself. For example, in Philippians 4.15, Paul responds to the, to the Philippians by thanking them for the offerings they gave. And you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church fellowship with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. Paul said, you gave me money, you supported me, you helped me live to, to be a preacher. And he, he had every right to that as, pastors, as a pastor in the church. And am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to the, those who examine me is this. Do we not have authority to eat and drink? Do we not have authority to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Because it, if he had a right as an apostle to eat and drink and have a family, if God so designs, and if he had the right to stop working to preach, then somebody's going to have to pay him. And that's what we do here at the local body. We have three full-time pastors here. Um, 
I am the senior pastor and the preaching pastor. Pastor Cal is the administrative pastor and the worship pastor. And Pastor Brian is the family pastor and the youth pastor. And then we have a Rachel who is our administrative assistant. And we have Aaron who is our child and children's coordinator here, director. And then uh, we have Zach in the back who is an intern here. You support us by your financial giving. When to give? We're told in 1 Corinthians 16 2, um, to uh, one on the first day of every week. Each one of you is to set something aside, saving whatever he has prepared so that no collection can be made when I come. I personally, and I'm old school, I like this. It's, you're not going to hell if you don't do it. But we write checks. And I know you still use checks. We write checks, and I and I uh, we're recording. Well, anyway, so we write checks. And if you notice, uh, I, I told Kathy, give me two checks on Sunday. Now we give our first fruits uh, giving every week, and we give our building fund giving every week. And what we do is we take the building fund, building fund, and I divide it between four payments for the month, so that. Your pastor can put a check in the basket at each service. Can you imagine what it looks like when you walk up here with a basket and I'm the first one up here and the preacher just passes the basket without putting anything in it? Pictures speak of value, uh, say a thousand words, right? Imagine we were online and they, somebody saw that. I'm not doing that to please them. I'm doing it to set an example. That's all I'm doing. But I give, I take seriously this it's an act of worship for Kathy and I. It is an act of worship for me to put that check in that basket. I'm worshiping. This is yours, Lord. This is what you have blessed me with. And this meager, what I'm giving back to you, Lord, use it for your glory. I pray that you, have, you don't do it as routine. I pray that you, just, you don't just click a button. and routine. I pray about it. You give online. We, we, we have grown. How, what percentage do you know, Pastor Cal? It's, it's, it's getting significant, isn't it? We, probably about 10% are giving online now. And, and when you do that, pray. Pray when you give. Give glory to God for what you're doing. So when to give. Um, also, uh, who gives? I'm going to tell you right now, on the first week, day of the week, every week, each one of you, each one of you, each one of you gives. That's what that means. Christian, you're not exempt from giving. Oh, pastor, you used to tell me that. Wait a minute, I'm, I'm a kid and I got a job and, and it, my parents give. No. If you're a believer in Christ and God has blessed you, you give of your first fruits. You give of Everyone who is a Christian should be giving back unto the Lord. If you have anything, you have something to give. Everybody gives. Everybody does. And where to give? On the first day of the week, every week, each one of you is to set something aside, saving whatever he has prospered the primary place of giving is your local body that's your primary place for giving i think that's what paul is saying here and i want to show you why he says put something aside and store it this text is teaching us that our primary place for our money is the local body you trust the elders to disseminate what god has given to you we don't hide it it's there the books are open to all of you you well, you we want to know what our salaries are go see pastor cal see jesse royal you, you nothing is is not is nothing is hidden from you and uh you always have that right to know that please please understand that our heart's desire and we answer the elders answer to god you give of your first fruits and you're trusting that the men that god has placed over a spiritual authority of you will use it for his glory and what to give each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So, every preacher loves speaking about money. Two things we learned today. One, if you're a Christian, you're called to serve. If you're a Christian, you're called to give. Father, thank you so much for our time together. And Lord, I, I, I pray for this flock, your sheep that are gathered here this day. Lord, I, it is such a privilege to co-shepherd them with the elders of this church. 
men and women who love you dearly. Not perfect men, not perfect women. But Father, this has always been a place, a desire to see Christ and him crucified preached and proclaimed. May that ever be the case here. Help us, Father. Help us to evaluate our own lives, to see if, if, if my brothers and sisters are serving, I, I, give you, I, give, I give you the glory for it. And Father, please, I pray they hear my heart and know that I appreciate all their service. But Father, if they fall short in that area and not serving at all, I pray, Lord, that they fall under your conviction, not mine, but yours. And I pray, Father, for our giving here at Grace Harvest. To you be the glory for it. You have done a mighty work here, and I thank you for the faithfulness of your people, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Father, may we, until the day comes that you call us home, one by one, or you gather your people on a day of rapture, may we be faithful to the calling you've placed in our lives. I ask this in the presence.